Hello and welcome to another episode of React Native Radio. Uh, I'm Jamin Holmgren, uh, co-hosting here, and I have with me Josh Justice. Hey, everyone. And Chuck Wood. Woo! <laughs> I was going to do that when you said Josh's name because he's awesome, but... Josh is awesome. Yes. Uh, Josh is normally the one to kind of kick things off here, but uh, he has a lot of opinions on the subject that we are about to talk about. So we're going to give his voice a rest as much as possible. Uh, so we can get as much <laughs> of that juicy opinion as we possibly can. Um, and the, uh, the topic in front of us today is kind of an interesting one, maybe a slightly uh, I don't know, a uh, controversial one, and that is uh, progressive web apps versus React Native. So we're going to be talking about progressive web apps, uh, what that even means, you know, what, 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 does, that, what does that mean, uh, and what the various uh, pros and cons, trade-offs that you, you kind of make when you do a progressive web app versus a React Native app, and perhaps per, uh, versus some of the other alternatives out there. If you're a front-end developer looking for remote work, then I recommend G2i, a React and React Native-focused hiring platform that will connect you directly with their clients that need your skill set. What makes G2i a unique hiring experience is that they spend the time marketing you to their clients of your choice. G2i is a team of engineers that technically vets you up front. If you pass their vetting, their clients have agreed to skip their initial interview process, saving you time and energy getting your next gig. They take care of all the hard work for you so you can get focused on development. To join G2I, go to g2i.co and apply. So first question I have to ask the panel uh, is, what is a progressive web app? Nobody knows. <laughs> <laughs> oh, did I say that out loud? What I meant is, if anybody has a good definition, I'd love to. I mean, I mean <clears throat> it's, it's an application that magically and wonderfully works on any system you run it on. That sounds wonderful. How about we just, everybody start doing that? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Let's do that. So um, Google has like a definition for it. And I don't know if I remember all of it. Um, and then I've heard other things added in, but um, essentially, for example, it works cross browser. It's supposed to load really fast on a slow connection. It has to be served over HTTPS. Um, you know, it has to be responsive. Um, I mean, I've, I've heard some definitions where they talk about um, like uh, having data on the server side or uh, using service workers, but I haven't seen that necessarily in Google's definition unless they've updated it. So the, the yeah, it's, it's not really a well-defined term at all. And uh, so this is one of the things that drives me a little bit crazy is that I mean, and we talk about PWAs or progressive web apps on like JavaScript Jabber and we get traffic because it's kind of a buzzword still or a buzz acronym. Um, but it, I mean, this is one of the things that drives me nuts is that we've got this target out there and we're all told that we're supposed to do this and nobody can even tell us what it is or how we're supposed to do it. So any, anyway, end rant, sorry. <laughs> The funny thing about this is the place that I was coming from, as far as how I hear the term used lately, is Twitter. Um, and on Twitter, what I hear PWA defined to mean is strictly only service workers. If you're using service workers, you have a PWA. And if you're not using service workers, you do not have a PWA. So it's very much a black and white thing. Um, I will, we, we can maybe get into details, but I will say service workers, um, just to define it quickly for folks who haven't heard the term, Service workers are a technology that we may get into a little bit later um, that allows you to define caching rules for your application. Um, and one of the main things you can do with that is to ensure all of your application's code and static assets are available offline so that if you're also like storing some data offline and using a different mechanism or the same mechanism, your web application can work while you're offline. Uh, I, I would say there are a bunch of caveats and complexities to that. Um, but yeah, the surprising thing about folks uh, in, in the popular usage, in my experience, uh, equating a PWA is a service worker, um, is that I think in the, the whole idea of the definition of PWA is I think it was supposed to be fuzzy. Like it's, I mean, the idea of the word progressive is, is something you gradually move towards or um, depending on what features different browsers have, they can embrace more or less of it. And so like it was intended to be fuzzy. And yet, I mean, Chuck, you're representing the, the 
consequences of that really well. You know, you see people with this lack of clarity around it. I see people that boil it down to just one very simple thing um, and sort of missing some of the point of it, I think. So yeah, it's, uh, it, it is proven to be a hard concept for folks to get their minds around. Yeah, I mean, that said, you know, service workers, if you're talking about caching and managing um, you know, data flow, then yeah, service workers are a great way to do that. But to my thinking, if I have an application that doesn't necessarily need that or needs very little of it, I don't even necessarily need a service worker to manage that, right? I mean, if I'm talking about a small amount of data and, you know, a very small set of very small images, I may be fine just loading them the normal way or the default way, I should say, and then caching them. Right. And then it works from then on because there's there's not a huge footprint for it. I think one of the things with PWAs is that it was it was really a marketing term you know, more so than anything yeah. else. And it was That's a fair. way it was a way for uh, I think Google to kind of compete against the move toward native apps. And so native apps were were taking over, you know, I remember the sort of the app craze. Everybody wanted to build an app and it was like you want to get your icon on everybody's home screen. Yeah. And uh, the biggest problem with that is it's very contrary to Google's um, b- business model. <laughs> that's that's what it is. Uh, Google has made billions and billions of dollars by being able to go out and get people's content uh, for free using web pages, like links to other web pages. And the fact that you can d- dive deep into a web page and and like slurp up all the data and then pull it into your your uh, search engine and and then you know obviously provide services around that most notably search uh is is what allows google to even survive or or be a company and google can't do that with an app they can't go into the facebook app they can't go into instagram they can't go into well you know apps that don't have a web presence as well i guess uh, or that are like gated off by a lo- login screen, they can't go in there and just slurp up all the data and then say, "Hey, you are looking for that um, that Vine that you remember seeing." Vine is an old app, but uh, you, know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying. <laughs> You're looking for you know something along those lines. Hey, we have it in our search index. They can't do that. So this is a threat to their business model. And so from my perspective, it was very much a business decision to start pushing PWAs because you put out a PWA. Uh, now, now you have the ability to index it. Now, the thing is with PWAs is that now they had to actually compete head to head with native app functionality and, and experience. And so that's why there's this fuzzy, okay, progressive enhancement, because we know that not all browsers are going to support this. So it still needs to work on old, old browsers. I mean, progressive enhancement has been an idea around since I started in the business. I, I remember, oh, yeah. you know, people talking about that. Uh, and then, Native like experience, that's really the head to head, like, you know, versus the, the yeah. native apps, uh, responsiveness, being being able to work on mobile phones and any other device out there. And then the offline storage part of it, which is really the, the, the service worker part. So to me, it was a marketing thing driven by business decisions, not so much the tech side of things. However, there are some valid tech reasons you admit might want to go that direction. For one thing, uh, they, they sort of get as uh, Ben Thompson uh, likes to say he he writes the the blog Stratechery. He they get a strategy credit. In other words, uh, they get to act like they're kind of on their high horse. You know, like like we're we're pushing the web forward, but it also helps their bottom line. <laughs> and that is that they can go yeah. in there and say, uh, well, an open web is good for everybody, and it's true. An open web is good for everybody. It's just especially good for Google. Yeah. Well, uh, first of all, I just want to point out that um, Vine for all you young people is what us old people had before TikTok. Second, (laughs) (laughs) we have to make those qualifiers, don't we? uh, Yeah. I I am not, I am not a fan of animal cruelty, but I want to murder all of the high horses. And third, (laughs) um, yeah, you know, I've seen PWAs include, you know, you're speaking to, you know, it competing with native apps. Or, you know, in our case, React Native is, you know, because it's an app that runs on the phone that's not on the web, you know, it competes in the same way. I mean, yeah, I've seen PWA definitions that include things like um, push notifications and things like that, which we actually have like on devchat.tv. It's it's a very 
uh, powerful marketing tool that you can put on your application. But the reality is, is you don't need it for the, the web experience. You know, you, you use it for the other reasons that you want. You know, I want to build a, a native app for devchat.tv. Why? Because then I can write, I have my um, icon on the home screen and I can send push notifications up. Hey, are you sure you didn't, you know, we pushed out a, a special episode of Ruby Rogues or React Native Radio or something, right? Uh, here you go, right? And, and get people in and get them to engage. And doing that on the phone is much more effective than doing that on the desktop most of the time. So, you know, just, just understanding all that stuff, you know, that, yeah, that's essentially what it was. And anyway, I think, I think there's some real power to it. Um, but I think there are trade-offs. Like, I, I don't think that PWAs are necessarily a bad thing. And I don't think that they're uh, inferior to native apps necessarily. It just depends on what you want. So, you know, we're talking about a lot of these options that you have in PWAs and how they're approached, right? You know, so it pulls down all that data and it caches it just like if you'd installed a, a native app, except not exactly. And you know, and so then it, it runs and it's fast and it's easy to access and all that stuff. And you can actually embed them on the home screen of your Android or iOS uh, phone. Sorry, I, want, I almost said machine, but phone. And so, you know, you can sort of use it as, you know, as you would a native app. But for me, I never do that. Um, I know people who are power users and they have bookmarks for websites on their home screen. But I don't know very many people that do it. Usually they're the power users. So that's, I mean, that's a trade-off, right? It's a real trade-off. You know, I think you can get the push notifications on your mobile device from a progressive web app. So that's interesting. But I think your browser has to be running in the background and you have to jump through some hoops. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's an interesting thing. And I'm happy to talk about what I think the trade-offs are. But... Yeah, that's that's one thing to consider. Yeah, let me mention a few of the, the downsides that I um, have experienced based on what you said, Chuck, um, are that specifically on iOS, because I'm an iOS user, um, it, unless you're writing an app, a web app that specifically targets Android, and that for a web app, that would be really surprising to only target one OS, like the idea would supposed to be that we could run it anywhere. Yes. Um, but I, in my understanding, push notifications are still not supported on iOS in progressive web apps. Um, so that, that is supported on Android, from what I've heard, but not on iOS. So if you're building an application that needs push notifications, that it's important. It's not just like a nice to have, but it's like, no, that's, that's a key part of the app's communication with the user. Um, then progressive web apps are not going to be an option for you on iOS. That would be something to drive you towards using a, a different solution, like mm -hmm. React Native, uh, maybe something else. The other thing is that I've, I've heard is that, and I've experienced this some, is that on iOS, and you've been able to save web, any web app to your home screen for a long, long time. Um, just any web page just kind of sticks on the home screen as a bookmark. Um, and you can, you know, using some of these PWA configuration features, you can specify an Apple specific, you know, home screen icon and that makes it look mm -hmm. nice. Right. But over, over the years, and I haven't double checked recently, but there have been a number of limitations with the way the apps run when they're run from the home screen. If you turn on like PWA the mode that will not just launch that as a bookmark into Safari, but will launch it as a separate app. Right. Including you don't get the browser controls, but that's just a, a form factor difference that you could plan for. But like there's there's bugs, like there's problems. Um, I think the very first app that I tried that on recently, um, it would lose the state as soon as it went in the background. And so I got to fill in the username and then I switched to my password manager to get my password. Oh, it's, it's, it's refreshed again, it started over. Um, and I'd heard the same from others that there were just so many bugs and limitations in iOS's home screen web app mode that you would basically, I would just, whenever I tried it, I would just always turn off that mode and have it just mm -hmm. function as a, as a bookmark to open up in regular Safari to get things to work properly. So that's two specific features of on iOS push notifications and home screen mode were so poorly supported that either I would, I would turn those things off on my web app. Or if I needed those things, if I needed something that, that went on the home screen and that had push notifications, that's when I would reach for React Native myself because that just seemed to run better on iOS. Right. Now, one thing that I will point out, and I've talked to a number of people that have done this and have done this to great effect, 
is that what they do is they essentially take their web app and they embed it in something like Cordova or Ionic, but they're not, they're not like building a full on Cordova or Ionic app. They're actually just loading the web view with their progressive web app in it and then adding small enhancements to it to make it feel natural. Right. Yeah, it's and more then, of a thin wrapper at that point. Right. Yeah. It's a thin wrapper. They kind of get an offline mode, right? So if they're not connected to the internet, it says, hey, we can't load it. Sorry. Um, you know, it has some mechanism for the push notifications. It's not necessarily the web push notifications. Right. And, you know, it has one or two other, you know, maybe they add in like, you know, access to the camera or something, but everything else is just, you know, yeah. Um, and so they, they've kind of worked that in the way that they want it. And I've seen that work fine. And if people are used to the web experience, especially, then any performance or behavior differences that aren't terribly natural to the mobile space, but are somewhat natural to the web space, people just kind of overlook it because it's a familiar yeah. interface. Infinite Red has been designing and shipping and building web and mobile applications for 10 years. They're experts in React Native and passionate advocates for remote work. They also host North America's only React Native conference, Chain React, attended by hundreds of developers all over the world. I actually went this last year. It was a ton of fun. If you start a project after hearing about them on this podcast, they'll give you two free tickets. You can learn more at radio.infinite.red. You know, going back to sort of incentives around this, um, one of the biggest drivers for uh, kind of resisting the adoption of PWAs has been Apple. Uh, they didn't have service workers for the longest time. Um, and when they finally came out, they were, you know, somewhat inferior. Uh, you know, they have a lot more bugs with it. I, I've actually found that people's opinions of PWAs tends to sort of cor correlate with what they use as a daily driver, you know, whether it's iOS or, or Android, because the experience on Android is pretty good overall. It's, it's not mm -hmm. as bad. And the experience on iOS is really bad. And really, when you look at the incentives, um, when you submit a, a, a PWA, uh, you don't, you, you just publish it, right? You don't submit it to the app yeah. store. There's no, there's no uh, gatekeeper. There's no 30% cut. When and and these are these are non technical reasons why someone might decide to do a PWA. I had someone come to me uh, not long ago and say, you know, we we want to we need to build a React Native app, and um, if it wasn't for iOS uh, not supporting the ability to basically take video and and upload it to the PWA, then uh, we would have already just used just built the PWA. And so there was there were some features that iOS it isn't you know Safari doesn't support right now so apple though wants that 30 percent. i mean they make a lot of money on that and they also yeah. want that uh that control over over their app store they want to be able to say no you can't publish this it's not up to our standards it doesn't doesn't get deliver the experience we want on our on iphones which is good for users in the sense that there's some level of expectation of quality you go to mm -hmm. google you go to you know google play although they're actually changing this now but for the longest time, you'd have just really horrible quality apps mixed in with the good ones. And then on the, the Apple side, you had generally better quality apps. Now, it's also bad for the user because there are situations where Apple will just say no, and they just use their their power to just say no, and, and the user mm -hmm. doesn't get a chance. They don't get a choice in it. Yeah. Well, the other thing is, is that I find that users are, and, and I don't, I can't blame Apple for this or anyone else for this. But users tend to blame issues that they run into with apps or web apps on the developer, not on Apple, right? And so if Apple lacks support for a specific feature in Safari and the, the web app doesn't work well there, it's generally put back on the, webs, the web app, right? As opposed to, you know, on Safari for not supporting the feature. And so, you know, you, you kind of have to play the game. Speaking of uh, browser support, this reminds me of uh, something you said a minute ago, Chuck, about um, the idea that every, that some folks might say that every web app should be a progressive web app, like add these things in. And I mean, I, in some sense, I would, argue, I, I would agree that like a lot of these features listed for progressive web apps are beneficial. Some of them, I would say even most web apps uh, have these days, whether you're thinking about the term PWA or not. 
Um, I think service workers in particular are a really interesting one in the React world. And where I ran across this was when Create React App, the um, Facebook official mechanism for running React web applications, had service workers enabled by default at one point. And then there was an extremely long uh, uh, GitHub issues discussing this and the problems and confusions that it caused. And they decided to, uh, starting with uh, Create React App 2.0, I believe, to turn service workers off by default. The functionality is still there, and so you could flip it on, but it's the difference between, hey, you are creating a React app for the first time, you got a service worker, versus like, no, it's there, so when you know what it is and you want to decide, you can turn it on. And in my experience, I think that's definitely the right thing. Um, on the client the client project that I'm on right now has a web component as well as a React Native component. And uh, we ran into a situation for where for years when they've done deployments, um, because they're using Create React app and service workers are enabled by default, um, it's just been very non-deterministic for them. Like, we don't know when the end users, uh, this, is, this is a corporate system as well, so it's not visible to the general public. Um, we don't know when the end users are going to see the new version versus the cached service worker version. Um, and you can say, well, no, you need to, you need to get good. Like, you need to understand how your service worker and your web browser caching is working and like plan it out. But that's exactly my point is that there is a cost associated with having service workers enabled. And so I, I certainly agree that it should not be the default in Create React app. And I would say that it's not the default in my applications either. My personal ones, my, mm -hmm. my client work, it's like, hey, there's a cost associated. Um, it is one of those things where you can uh, permanently mess up your app you could get a service worker cast and users uh, br things, uh, you know, browsers where unless they clear their cache, they're not ever going to see the new version of your app with the bug fix. Um, so there's there's only a few things on the web that can permanently break your app. So those are things to be very very careful about. Um, and I have there's a, um, a, a a conference talk about that about somebody's story about a service worker getting cached indefinitely that I'll paste in the show notes. Um, but yeah, so like I would not uh, reach for service workers automatically. I would decide. Is it worth the care that's needed to make sure you don't get yourself stuck like that? Um, and the care that's needed to troubleshoot it when we've done a deployment to the staging server, but we're not seeing the new version yet. And why is that? And do we really want, is it really value for us to think through that right now if there's never really any need for our users of our particular app to have it available offline? Maybe it's not providing any benefit at that point. Right. Well, and a lot of this really comes down to what you need, right? And if you have a small team, you just want to develop an app, you want it to work nicely on phones, you're willing to work around the issues that exist, you know, in Safari, whatever, you know, or maybe do the, the you know, really light custom shell around your web app, then, then, you know, maybe that is the right way to go. And then you can always revisit the decision later and say, okay, now we need it. Now we need the native app, right? Yeah, and that was, um, I went to a talk down in Portland uh, several years ago, actually. So PWAs were kind of just getting started, really. And so it wasn't really so much around, the talk wasn't so much around PWAs, but it's just, just sort of talking about the web experience versus um, versus mobile app experience and when you would want to do one or the other. And I think that the, the opinions have held up over these years. And the, the guy who given the talk basically said, um, that the web is really amazing for discoverability and uh, sort of introducing yourself to, you know, to people and for lighter interactions. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, but then a mobile app is when you want a deeper relationship because the home screen is sacred and it becomes a more you're not going to discover something brand new on the app store. People don't go and like search the app store for, for stuff. Uh, that's brand new unless they've already heard about it elsewhere, already been on the website and been pushed to like, you know, uh, uh, load the, uh, the app. And so uh, it's very much like they each kind of build different niches there. You have like, um, uh, well, a good example of this might be like a pizza place. Uh, if you're just going to order from them once, you're not going to download their app. You're just going to go to their website on your right. phone and, and like, like order the pizza and then, you know, go grab the pizza. But if it's the pizza place that you visit down the road all the time, 
you tend to download the app if it doesn't suck. Uh, you tend to download it because it's going to remember who you are. It's going to remember all your preferences. And when you tap on the thing and it loads up, it's just going to be, you know, a smoother, better experience overall. And that's like a deeper relationship. So that, it's sort of the difference between the pizza place near the motel, you know, the hotel that you're, you're, you're staying at uh, for the night versus the, you know, the pizza place next to your, next to your house. Um, and I, I, I think that that, that sort of division has worked out really well for quite a while. Uh, what PWD, PWAs do is sort of blur that line um, and, and, you know, make it so that the, the website is also the deeper experience, hopefully, but, it, uh, you know, the execution leaves a little bit to be desired. I do, obviously, this is React Native Radio. This is the, the podcast mm-hmm. about React Native. We all uh, on this panel are big React Native fans uh, for, for obvious reasons. And so talking about the, the trade-offs of doing, um, you know, if you're talking about just the technical trade-offs, like, hey, I want to be able to build an app for all platforms and uh, use JavaScript. Well, both React Native and PWAs are an option in that situation. You can build a, a cross-platform app in, in React Native in JavaScript using the same code. Uh, you know, it's not, it's not like, in fact, you can actually build Interestingly, you can build PWAs using React Native Web. You can actually do that. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> I think that's actually a, a pretty legit way to go. So it is possible to use both in that in that regard. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, the thing that um, I like about PWAs is the same thing I like about React Native, right? Is that I can use the technology I already know. I can use an approach that I'm somewhat familiar with. And, you know, I don't have to go way out of my way to enhance the app one way or the other for Android or iOS. Um, PWAs just kind of give me that extra step, obviously when the features are supported, but I can enhance an app that I've already built. And so that's, that's the draw there is, okay, how much effort do I have to put in and what, what, uh, trade-off do I have to make? And the effort I have to put into learning Swift and Kotlin and doing all the native stuff and building two apps and blah, 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 versus the the ramp up time of i already know javascript i'm you know i'm at least passingly familiar with react and so you know again it's it's a lower barrier and then it's a lower barrier still for me to say all right well i'm going to add in um service workers and you know a, a a caching strategy on an app i've already built and so you know again it's just that that level of commitment that i have to make in order to get something that works yeah, the more steps we can give folks in between a web application and learning native development, the better, because it just gives yeah. folks an option to reach for them. Um, it really helps out. Yeah, I'm going to add a link to the show notes real quick. Uh, Ryan, me, I, I've spent time in the Ember JS world to continue for me to cross all the boundaries. Um, and their keynote talk at the Ember Conf 2016 uh, hit upon the mobile web and uh, mobile native mobile apps as well. Um, I don't think this is what you were referring to earlier, Jamin. Maybe it was because we got we got Ember background together. Um, but uh, this is a great summary of the the form factor differences and the differences between you know how the web tends to work and what it's great at and what mobile is for. And they also at that time were looking for ways to um, get the best best of both worlds and things like that. But yeah, I think the um, the, the, the descriptions of the two platforms really hold up. And so I'm going to link to that keynote uh, with a, a link to the timestamp where that conversation uh, happens. You know, it's interesting too, because everybody's looking for that. I mean, we've got um, Ionic was very Angular focused and then they kind of broadened out because they realized that um, Vue developers and, and now they're working on React developers too, right? Want some option to go kind of the next step um, into mobile uh, native script made a big splash in Angular and then made a big splash in Vue, right? In their support there because people want those paradigms in a mobile space. And so, yeah, a lot of this makes sense. This is this is all something we're looking for. I think React has benefited from having a React native for a, a while now in the sense that, hey, this is a paradigm I understand, you know. It totally has. I mean, yeah. honestly, we, we moved to React Native because our previous solution wasn't really working out. We were we were coding natively, and then we used RubyMotion for a while, and that kind of went down. And uh, so we, we were looking for alternatives, and we found React Native. And that actually brought us backwards into React itself. We were using Ember, just like Josh. And mm-hmm. at that point, it was like, why are we using React on mobile and Ember on web? Um, 
you know, let's ditch Ember and let's go with React on the on the web as well. And at that point, it wasn't as clear cut as it is now. Like in 2015, Ember was still a pretty big deal. Um, you know, React was still kind of an up and coming thing. And uh, for us to actually turn around and say, no, we're not going to do Ember, we're going to do React instead, which ended up being a great decision, <laughs> um, was was uh, entirely because of React Native. It was a driving force to to bring us back into that. And still, people come up with all these really interesting ideas like Svelte and, and uh, you know, of course, Vue and things like that. And uh, while they have some like semi janky, you know, versions of React Native, generally speaking, built on top of actually React Native, uh, they just don't have the same story that React does, where it's React and React Native. It's very straightforward. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of, you know, like you're and, and the other thing is like we've taken our, our web developers and made them mobile developers and vice versa. And uh, in in a current project we're working on, we actually have um, web and mobile developers working seamlessly on the same stuff. Uh, they're not, there isn't really a division. In fact, I, I stopped calling our teams the web team and the mobile team and I started calling it the front end and the back end team because front end team can do both web and mobile together. Uh, so th those are all reasons why uh, having that same paradigm across all these different platforms makes sense. Hey folks, this is Charles Maxwood and I just launched my book, The Max Coder's Guide to Finding Your Dream Developer Job. It's up on Amazon. We self-published it. I would love your support. If you want to go check it out, you can find it there. The Max Coder's Guide to Finding Your Dream Developer Job. Have a good one. Max out. React Native is definitely my biggest draw to the React world as well. Um, there's a lot of pros for React for the web. Um, I find a lot of pros in Vue.js as well. Um, and so I'm kind of personally torn and Big Nerd has work in Vue.js as well as in React. But for kind of my personal focus, you know, that great native option, I, I still feel like uh, React Native is just so much more vetted, broadly established, such a larger community than the other JavaScript native options, um, just and uh, you know, in terms of polish, um, in terms of broad support, in terms of finding those open source libraries you need that is and like, in terms of uh, and in terms of podcasts, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's a good one. Yeah, it just, I mean, and it, it very much relates to this topic where when it comes to what we're offering to clients and when it comes to what I'm reaching for on my personal projects, just knowing that it's like, I mean, any, any given project that I come up with as a hobby side thing, I'm like, cool, what do I need to do? Do I need offline? Do I need notifications? Like, cool, all right, well, this one's gonna be in React Native. Like, do I need it to pull it up in a web browser? All right, well, those other things aren't as important. I'll just do it on the web. Well, it'll work just fine on the phone for me as well. Um, or maybe I end up developing both and it's not a whole lot of cost. Um, but yeah, the when it comes to software moats in terms of like, what's the unique offering that keeps you from switching to something else? React Native is definitely the moat for the React world for me that kind of keeps me here. Yeah. Uh, so for a long time, for a long time, I basically said um, when people had asked my opinions of PWAs uh, versus mobile uh, native mobile apps, I would say, um, well, I'll believe PWAs when I see requests for them. You know, when, when people are coming to us and saying, we need you to build us a PWA. Because as a consultancy, we sort of have that luxury of letting the market drive us a little bit. Um, and it's starting to happen. People are coming to us now. It does happen uh, here and there. Uh, but what I found is that usually when people are coming to us and ask, asking for a PWA, it's their second choice. They looked at native mobile uh, development and they concluded it was too expensive. And they're hoping that PWAs are less expensive, which is not the case. It's That's still the same. Yeah, still the same you know, amount of work. You, in fact, in some cases you have to do a little more work. Uh, it, it's maybe a little less specialized skill um, in terms of, you know, your, you know, mobile development is kind of more of a specialized skill, but less so with React Native, of course. Uh, but yeah, they've come to us and they've said, well, we can't really afford a, a native app, but we'd like to do a PWA. And then, of course, you know, when we tell them how much it costs, then that kind of eliminates that option and they either don't do the project or they end up deciding to go with a native app. Rarely is it like, I'd like to do a PWA first. And that, that's the experience I want for my users. Right. Well, and that makes sense too. I mean, we talked about the reasons why you would want one over the other. And I think as far as marketing goes, having a mobile first mobile app experience, um, unless you've got some, some other reason 
I think is by far the, the best marketing play you can make. Um, and the reason is, is because you get on that home screen, um, they can kind of take it with them wherever they want and, and things like that. Um, the only thing that I can think of that might be a little bit different is, for example, podcasts, right? Um, and even then, I, I want a, an app for the podcast network, but um, most people consume our content in another app, right? And so that's, you know, that's the only reason why I could see you might want something else is because you, you have to interact with people in a way that is, you know, you're not controlling the user interface like, like podcasts. Yeah. Going to what Jamin was saying about how they think about PWAs at big nerd ranch. What our thinking right now is really, you know, for our web development, like we do and want to continue to do and get better and better at creating web applications with excellence. And part of that is these features like service workers and knowing the pros and cons and when to reach for them and when not to, as well as other things, uh, you know, different mechanisms for using browser or local storage to store data offline. Um, you know, web sockets for real-time connections, abstractions over that, like GraphQL subscriptions. Um, I've been, we mentioned before that I'm playing around with PouchDB for um, automatic syncing and Firebase, of course, has that out of the box for you as well. And so it's like these, these features are different, like, hey, you know, you need a web application? Like, that's great. Like, we want to help you make the best web application you possibly can and to go with the features that you need uh, when you need them, when they add value that is worth the cost. So really, it's just exactly the same attitude that we've been describing this whole time. And yeah, it's it's less of a, you know, you know we, we don't really see PWAs as a, a marketing point to bring in business at this point. So much as just, hey, let's talk through what's going to help you the best and help your customers the best. Yeah, and that's ultimately the kind of the the adult way to look at this, you know, like like we it's a series of trade-offs which doesn't make for as maybe compelling of uh of an argument on on a <laughs> on a podcast, but it is true. Uh now, I mean, I still have opinions about it. I still feel like for the most part uh going with a native well, React native specifically app, you're going to have a better experience for your users overall and if you want to do the web, uh, do the web, you know, like, like, don't try to make it an app, make it, make it a web, uh, web app. And, yeah. uh, but maybe that's just, uh, maybe where I came from talking as well. Uh, there's, you know, there's, there's definitely room for lots of different opinions here from reasonable people. Yeah. And, and like I said, I mean, ultimately, you know, I, I mentioned the, the user interface, but the other thing is, is, you know, if it's a small incremental cost to make PWA happen on your, on your website and you can market that well. Yeah. Totally. I don't see any reason not to do it that way. Yeah. But you know, you have to be cognizant that, you know, yeah, eventually there is a trade off that is going to happen there and you've got to decide how that fits in with your overall strategy. But yeah, other than that, I, I totally agree. I think that's covered most of my, my opinions on this topic. Do y'all have anything uh, we didn't hit that you want to get to? I don't know. I need to pound the table on something. <laughs> Instead of throwing out a big fat, it depends. But. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I think I, I got most of my opinions out. Yeah. Cool. Do we want to go to picks? Sure. Cool. I'll, I'll share a couple first. So uh, um, over the last year or so, um, my family, I've got three small kids, and uh, we've picked up a few card games um, that we've been really enjoying together. I think our my wife and I and our six-year-old have been able to play them. The three-year-old kind of like joins a team, and so she's kind of with us. Um, but they're a lot of fun. Um, so they're both by a company called Game Right, and I'll put the links to the two games that we've played in the show notes. Um, one of them is called Sleeping Queens. Um, this is one that uh, a family with kids they actually developed, developed together with their kids, and they make a point about how they forgot this one card that was like their daughter's favorite card in the first version, so they added it into the second version. Um, wow. Just really fun. Uh, another one's called Sushi Go. Uh, and I love sushi, and so it makes me very hungry when I play this game. Um, <laughs> but it's fun. It's got some kind of unique rules around um, how you kind of the points are totaled up and things like that. It, it's complex enough that we're only gradually introducing some of the cards uh, with our six-year-old. So it's mm -hmm. um, you know these are not necessarily just for families like with young kids. You know our, our kids are maybe a little bit young for it even. Uh, Sleeping Queens is totally fine for the six-year-old, but Sushi Go it, it's maybe a bit targeted at a bit more of an older uh, age group. Okay. Um, 
but yeah, it's a lot of fun. So yeah, check them out. And uh, these are high enough quality that I definitely say that uh, checking out other games by Game Right could be really fun as well if you enjoy card games and, and want something fun. I, I find it interesting that Sleeping Queens was invented by a six-year-old, but for for people eight and up. <laughs> that is hilarious. <laughs> yeah, we played uh, Sushi. We have Sushi Go Party, which is the, it, it's a little bit bigger game. It it plays up to six people, I think, instead of four. Um, and it's it's a fun game, definitely a fun game. And it's a fun game to play with just adults. So That's cool. that one's definitely on the list. Um, For my pick, uh, I actually, so I had a a friend of mine message me, as I do from time to time, uh, asking, you know, what would be a path if I want to do self-learning to learn to be a developer, what what path would I take? And of course, there are other options out there, different like types of schools and and boot camps and things like that. Um, And so... uh, but yeah, I, he asked, uh, and he's a, he's a self-starter. He's a very motivated guy. And so uh, I asked on Twitter and I got this great article that was just published last month by Andre. Uh, I'm going to butcher his last name. Yeah, I, I, I can't, I, I don't know how to say his last name, but uh, the article is, is uh, published on zero to mastery.io and it's learn to code in 2020, get hired and have fun along the way. And um, it's a really good article about, uh, it, first it kind of talks about why would you learn to code and, uh, what you're going to kind of learn to do. Uh, it talks about electron and react native and some other d- different tools like that. But then there's a five month step-by-step, like the first month is the big picture kind of gives you a bunch of links to go through. There's a ton of hours of, uh, of content there. Second month, you learn JavaScript. Third month, you learn JavaScript, NPM, building a website. Uh, Fourth month, you learn React. In the last month, you learn some server database and and kind of back-end technology. So it is kind of front-end focused, React focused. Um, But I I found it extremely uh, helpful and uh, looked through it and and thought it was great. So I sent it over to him and I'm going to keep this as a resource going forward. Really, really good uh, resource for people learning to or wanting to learn to program but are self-starters who don't necessarily uh, want to go down the, the code, you know, school path. Right. Yeah. There's a, there's a series. Um, oh, what is it? Oh, my brain totally blanked. Quincy Larson, a free, free code camp. Yeah. I recommend free, free code co- camp as well. Curriculum. Cause that one yeah. I've heard a lot of good things about. I haven't actually checked it out myself, but yep. I've heard a lot of good things. Yeah, when I'm tired, I kind of have to make the connections in my brain. <laughs> I'm like, okay, what's the guy's name? Because I can't remember the name of the <laughs> program. Anyway, yeah, that's that's terrific stuff. I'm going to throw out a few picks. Um, as far as games that you can play with your kids, um, another game that we've really enjoyed, and this is something that like my four-year-old can play. It's called Hiss. And I, I don't know if it's made by Game Right as well. They They make all kinds of games at all different levels. But essentially, it's a color matching game. And so um, you have like different segments of a snake. And um, yeah, it is a game right game. Anyway, um, so yeah, so you you basically match up the colors. And then um, if you complete a snake, in other words, if you put the last piece in from the head to the tail, then you get to collect the entire snake and whoever has the most tiles wins. Um, but we've had that game for years and my kids have all loved it. My older kids enjoy playing it sometimes, even though it's pretty simple for them. So I'm going to pick that, um, as far as games for your kids. Another one is, um, uh, King of Tokyo and King of Tokyo is a dice and card game. Um, it's got a little board in the middle. And so, um, you can put your character or your monster in the middle of Tokyo. Um, and then essentially your, the goal is, is to either um, get 20 points or to kill all the other monsters and whoever does one of those first wins. So that, that's a, that's a fun game. Um, the rules around the cards get a little bit complicated, but kids can play it with help. No problem. And the rest of us just rolling dice and then deciding which ones to keep and which ones to roll again. So, um, yeah, pretty simple. Lots of fun. The kids love playing the monsters. And so that that's awesome. 
As far as the rest of it goes, I'm just going to throw a few things out. So I am working on getting the page up for the workshops uh, that I'm going to be putting on uh, here within the next month or two. Um, basically, I'm looking to do like eight to 12 weeks. Um, one of them is going to be group coaching on finding your next job. And it's very focused on finding a job you're going to be happy at. Um, so if you're looking for your first job or you're not happy where you're at, or you feel like it's time to move, um, sign up. Um, I'm, I'm looking at about $500 a month. So if it's a eight weeks, it's going to be a thousand dollars. And if it's 12 weeks, it'll be $1,500. Um, same thing for how to stay current. I get asked that all the time and it's like, all right, how do you keep your skills current? Here we go. Right. And I'll walk you through how we figure out what to cover on the shows, how we know what's coming up, what's coming down the pipe with the different communities, um, how we get in touch with people, how to find mentors, all that stuff. So we're, we're going to be going into that and that'll probably be eight to 12 weeks as well. And then finally, a lot of folks are just looking for a way to connect with other people on a regular basis and have quality interactions and move their careers along. And so I'm going to be starting a mastermind group. And so if you are, if you're not aware of mastermind groups, it was um, described in Think and Grow Rich, I think, by Napoleon Hill. And basically, it's all of us putting our heads together and working on your problems. And the next week, we work on somebody else's problems, right? Or, or just how do I move forward? How do I, you know, what am I not seeing? Where are my strengths? Where are my weaknesses? You know, and, and I do this for business. But I find that it's very, very um, beneficial for um, for people to do. So if if you're kind of wanting to launch your career and move into the next phase, whether it's speaking, whether it's, you know, team leadership, whether it's something else, whether it's just I want to learn React, React Native better. Um, yeah, we're going to be doing that every week. I'm probably just going to have a session on Fridays. And uh, yeah, we'll just take turns helping each other out doing that. And uh, that'll also be $500 a month. So, um, and that one's going to be less me coaching and more everybody helping everybody. Yep. So, That's cool. Awesome. I've heard you mentioned uh, mastermind groups over the years and I never quite connected exactly how they work. So that was a great summer. That makes a lot of sense. That'll be super helpful. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah. So the mastermind group, you are also going to have to apply because I'm looking for specific people who are looking to help other people mm. and are looking to get that kind of help that we're talking about. Got it. So it's not just anybody that that one I'm going to screen people on. The, yeah. uh, the other ones are going to be basically first come first serve and the group coaching sessions. I really hesitate to go beyond like 12 to 15 people. So, right. Mm -hmm. So cool, if, Chuck. if you want those, you better jump on them now. Um, and all that will be at devchat.tv slash workshops. And uh, awesome. there'll be a little more information there and you can sign up. So anyway, I, I, I just plugged a whole bunch of stuff that I'm working on, but yeah, that's, that's what we're looking at. Very cool. Well, thanks so much uh, to you all for, for doing the panel today. Um, yeah, thanks, uh, Josh uh, and, and Chuck. Really appreciate it. It's always fun to, to have these conversations, uh, of course, this time on PWAs and React Native, but uh, other topics as well. Um, and uh, thank you, a special thank you to the audience for coming along with us for this ride. Uh, if you have opinions about PWAs, we do want to hear them. Uh, you can follow the, uh, the podcast on Twitter, uh, React Native Radio. It's R underscore N underscore radio. Uh, you can follow Josh uh, coding it wrong. You can follow Ch Chuck at CMaxW. And you can follow me, uh, Jamin Holmgren, just my first and last name on Twitter and feel free to, to tweet out. If you have opinions, uh, we're, we're happy to engage on that. Thank you so much. And we'll see you next time. Bye, Max everyone. out everybody. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y.com to learn more.